You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Giro d'Italia, supported by Science in Sport. Today we are in Asolo. Hello, I'm Lionel Burney. I'm with Daniel Freeb. Hello, Lionel. Hello, Daniel. Dove siamo? Oh, that's a good question. My mind's gone completely blank. Asolo. We're in, we're in Asolo. We're in Italy. Well, that's like what our, what's been our, our press headquarters for the afternoon. Just a stone throw from the finishing line. A little bit of a buffet here. There's some pasta and a bit of Prosecco. Been, been you, quite pleasant. You always sound, start to sound perky when the word buffet is mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah, I do. I think eating nice things is a pleasure. <laughs> it is, Lionel. It is. And drinking nice things, we're... We've been given a glass, a very small, modest glass of Prosecco. Prosecco produced in the vineyards around Asolo and going further towards Conegliano, Valdo Biadine. We'll, we'll be there again in a couple of days, but we're having a glass of bubbly to celebrate or certainly cogitate today's events. We are indeed. Well, let's get on to today's event because it's been another packed day on the Giro. It was stage 11 from Modena to Asolo, 227 kilometres. There was a very fast start to a predominantly flat stage. An early break of nine, which included Manuel Quinziato, Moreno Moser and Lee Howard and Filippo Pozzato. I was going to say, come on, line I was nearly going to miss him out. couldn't miss out Pozzato. They got away but really got nowhere. And it took uh, around 70 kilometres for, for any kind of break to get away. Three men, Vigard Steker Langen, uh, Liam Batazzo and Anton Vorobiev finally got away. And they stayed away until the fourth category climb, which came with 20 kilometres to go. Langen was the last man caught just as he reached the top. Just before the climb, there was a split in the bunch following a crash, which left the pink jersey Bob Jungles with very little support from his Etics Quick Step teammates. On the descent of that climb, Vincenzo Nibali, Alejandro Valverde and Esteban Chavez pushed clear. They were then caught, and just as he did yesterday, Andre Amador of Movistar attacked. Bob Jungles, who had been isolated, left without much team support, took it on himself to respond. And then Diego Lulissi, who won stage four, seized the moment and he got across the gap. And those three stayed away to the finish. They got up through the small, pretty town of Castel Cucco and held on to the finish line where Ulissi easily won his second stage of the Giro. Jungles and Amador, who were first and second overall, gained 11 seconds on the rest. The big losers of the day, Jakob Fuglsang, who was eighth this morning, and Domenico Pozzavivo, who was 11th, slipped a handful of places overall. The other big news from here is that Tom Dumoulin of Giant Alpersin, who won the opening time trial and held the pink jersey for six days, pulled out of the race midway. We'll hear from him a little bit later on. The jerseys then stay on all the same shoulders. Bob Jungles is in pink and white. Andre Greipel still has the red jersey and Damiano Cunigo has a healthy lead in the blue King of the Mountains. Meanwhile, on the other side of the pond, our contributor Kaylee Fretz is now at the Tour of California where Tinkoff's Peter Sargon and Etik's Quick Steps, Julian Alaphilippe, have won the opening two stages. We might hear from Kaylee next week, I think. We might, and it was breathless stuff today, wasn't it? We thought we were pretty sure that it was going to be a routine transitional stage, but does such a thing exist at the Giro? Uh, you know, we, we did see on the profile that climb, the Forcella Mostacin, I think it's called, and the penultimate climb on today's stage, and we thought there was a small possibility that something might happen there. The general classification riders might be coaxed into action, and sure enough, that's what happened, and Bob Jungels, it's always great to see the leader in a stage race, the pink jersey, attacking. And, and I think you know you spoke to Etics Quick Step Director Sportif, David Bramati at the finish, and he suggested it was more for, for practical reasons, really. There'd been a bit of kerfuffle, a bit of a crash earlier on in the stage, which we'll talk about later in the episode. But really, it made sense for Jungels to attack on two levels, one to gain time, and also because he was pretty isolated at that point, and it was probably the safest place to be at the front of the race. Well, that was exactly it. That's what Bramati said. Um, Etix lost, uh, I think, four or five riders in a crash that came around 40 kilometres from the finish when the bunch split. That left Jungels pretty much on his own. I think he had Matteo Trentin with him, but that was that was it. And uh, so when it all kicked off on the climb, the safest place to be was to be at the front, alert and reacting rather than playing catch up behind and, and it worked out well for him and you know he perhaps could have won that stage if he hadn't done so much pulling on the front on the run in into the town here he, he could have won that stage certainly and it, it really set things up 
though unfortunately or, or fortunately for Diego Lucy because he was really in a perfect position with Jungels and Amador both having a lot to gain from being in that move both gaining time on general classification neither well they were both quite happy to do some work I mean certainly Jungels did a lot more work than Amador but they were both content to go to the finish gain that little bit of time not so bothered about the stage victory although Amador did contest the sprint but Ulisi was really in the perfect sandwich there wasn't he because um, he was the fastest guy in that group and you know he came into this Giro I know he came in in great form he was very very light you could see straight away as soon as you looked at the profiles of this Giro d'Italia that there were a couple of stages, two or three stages that suited him perfectly. And the way things have panned out um, have have been exactly as he would have imagined in his wildest dreams at Praia Mare and then here in Azolo. And again, he showed his class really. And, um, you know, uh, Paolo Bettini, who is a rider he's been compared to in the past after the stage winning Praia Mare, said that this was a real breakthrough for Elise because he's a very, very talented rider, but he's lacked confidence. He's lacked a bit of some daring do in the past. Um, and, and that could have been the real turning point, uh, the, the real sort of game changer in terms of his confidence and that now he would really seize the nettle grasp, grasp, grasp the nettle, nettle grasp yeah. the nettle I'm trying to think in different languages um, <laughs> grasp the nettle and rather than just getting it wrong exactly yeah, yeah, getting yeah, it wrong yeah, yeah. and that's exactly what he did today wasn't he he really he chose his moment perfectly at the bottom of the final climb into Azolo um, he latched on to Amador and Jungels and he just really sat on the wheels and cruised in and was always going to be the fastest guy in the finishing straight. Yeah, he was. And uh, it's remarkable, isn't it? We're, what, 11 stages in and the spoils have been shared around really a very small number of teams, certainly in terms of, of uh, the stage winners. What have we got? Al- Giant Alpacin, Etix Quickstep of 1-3, Lotto Sudal of 1-3, Lotto NL Jumbo of 1-1 and Lamprey Merida of 1-2. There's a, a lot of teams that really haven't made a great deal of impact in this race. And that might well be because... If you look at the likes of uh, Tinkoff and Movistar, Astana, uh, even Cannondale, you know, they're keeping everything dry for the GC battle next week, which we should turn our minds to now, really, because the GC riders did show themselves a little bit. There was that move on the descent when Vincenzo Nibali, Alejandro Valverde and Esteban Chavez, who's looking pretty perky, um, got away. Again, wasn't perhaps the most obvious place um, to make a move until you realise that you're talking about Nibali and Valverde who are two of the best descenders in the race An odd move I thought from Nibali when you consider the stages to come and you consider the fact that he came into this Giro in subpar form I would say you know Giro del Trentino he really struggled um, didn't look particularly good at uh, Rocarazzo the first mountain top finish and you consider the stages to come you consider this weekend in particular the Cividale del Friuli which I think is the perfect stage to him with the hardest descent the most dangerous descent of the Giro then you've got the mountain time trial to Alpe di Siusi then you've got the Dolomite blockbuster to Corvara and really it's a question now of saving as much energy and being as economical as possible or so you would think you would think that Nibali would just be economizing now with those stages in mind and with the final week in mind but he said at the finish that he believes that he has to seize every opportunity not grasp line or seize it's the right verb this time seize every opportunity just to gain 20 30 40 seconds and before we hear from Nibali because I did go to the Astana bus and see what he had to say at the finish. We have the the man who knows more about Vincenzo Nibali than Nibali himself and probably knows more about Nibali's tactics today than Nibali himself. Chiros con Emilio, it's been a few days, but you're back finally, mercifully. F- finally, hopefully, dear listeners, I would like to stay here every day and also every night because, my, in my opinion, next step, we c- could organise a podcast in the night. Why not? Instead of sleeping during the podcast, why not, Lionel? Uh, Dad, we we are all together. So why we could think about a podcast by night? Why not? But well, was was Vincenzo Nibali hallucinating when he thought it was a good idea to go on the attack on the Forcella Mostacin well, today? Well, well uh, I think that the Asana tactics change a little bit. bit for the crash, because more or less almost all the team was involved in a crash before and so the tactic was not the tactic that we have planned. In a certain way, I had an impression in the finish line, I had an impression that Nimbali was a little bit upset with 
Valverde because Valverde didn't give him an help in the action but as a matter of fact Nibali said now uh, we had the possibility to speak to him just a few minutes ago he explained that he was not angry with Valverde well so. there you go Chiro you've said that his opinion seems to have changed in the last hour when he's maybe thought a little bit more coldly a little bit more coolly about Valverde's tactics but let's just hear from him now Straight after the finish line on the Astana bus, I was there and this is what Vincenzo Nibali had to say about Valverde's tactics and his own tactics. Mi sono mosso, c'è stata quell'accelerazione in salita da da parte di Cruisvi there was an attack on the climb by Krosivik. Then I knew the descent was so hard, so I tried to go away. There were three of us, but Valverde wasn't very committed and there was no harmony in the group. I set up, then another race started. Prior to that, there had been a big crash and all of our riders had gone down, except Malakane and Kotzhatayev. So I had to be careful. I told Valverde to pull and he said he wouldn't because he had Amador in the group behind. We sat up got caught, then Amador attacked immediately. I think they want to go for GC with Valverde and Amador. If Valverde had really wanted to gain time on some of the other rivals today, he would have worked with me. He didn't. So it looks as though they're keeping their options open. We had to jump on any opportunity that presented itself. We're here to race, not to go for a leisure ride. When we see a chance, we have to take our opponents by surprise. Counter-attack. Getting it right isn't always easy. Before we go to the finish today, there were riders all over the road. We set up because Valverde wouldn't collaborate. But if he had, we might have gained 30, 40 seconds, which could have been very valuable. Chiro, he seems to have calmed down a bit after the finish. He seems to have a new perspective on events today in this stage at, that's finished at Azolo. You mean in the shark? Yeah, yeah, the shark. Yeah, yeah, the shark. I mean, for the shark, uh, the, these stages are not really the most important stages of this Giro. He always tries something because his way of uh, doing the bicycle racer, yes, but, and uh, we have to remember also that six, six years ago, he won his first stage in his career in the Giro d'Italia in Asolo. Maybe he was a little bit inspired by this, maybe not, but I think that this weekend would be crucial for him more than these stages, yes. What's that noise, Daniel? What's that noise? I think the shark tail's coming. Pensare troppo fa male a un corridore che punta tutto sugli attacchi repentini e non è abituato a fare calcoli. Thinking too much hurts a rider who wants to attack repeatedly and race instinctively. So there, Lionel, that was Vincenzo Nibali not talking about today's stage, not talking about cycling. Chira will approve because you don't particularly enjoy talking about cycling. He was talking about breaking up from his first girlfriend, Elena, and how... It was very difficult to think, very difficult to have clear thoughts in that period, very difficult to concentrate on bike racing. And, um, you know, are his thoughts, have his tactics so far in this Giro d'Italia suggested that his mind is confused and addled in a similar way, Chira? Um, I don't think so. In this case, uh, I must confess that he seems to be very concentrated, very on the paper of this race. I mean, also, you remember the polemic against the car after the stage of Roccarasso. He gives me the impression that he's really motivated in order to try to win the pink jersey in this Giro. But I think that he's also... I mean, it's also sure that it won't be easy because there are a lot of main contenders. Some of them expected as Valverde, for example, but also Char but also other ones, as for example Amador uh, or Jungels. Why not? But Chiro, there is a school of thought that you know we've got the Agnello, the Colle, Colle dell'Agnello, we've got the Bonnet, we've got five passes in the Dolomites. Why attack? Why try to gain 20, 30, 40 seconds on a day like this? He said in the interview there that every opportunity is an opportunity to gain time and that he should jump on any opportunity. But it does seem slightly strange. And there is a school of thought that Nibali attacked today because he's not going very well and he needs to be opportunistic. He needs to look for any opportunity to get rid of people like Chavez, Micah, Zacharin, who he's worried about. 
Uh, well, the real answer to this question will certainly arrive, will start to arrive in the weekend. But this school of thinking is not bad. Could be true. Yes, listeners, I have not the answer. Yes, I must confess, because I'm not God, it seems. It seems sometimes for my listeners, for our listeners, but uh, could be a good, uh, a good idea. And moreover, I see that, for example, the Movistar guys as Valverde and Rodolfo Amador, they look very strong, so they can be really a really danger for the shark. Very interesting piece in your newspaper yesterday, I think, Chiro, about Nibali's preparation for this Giro. How many kilometers he'd done this year? Something like 13,887. It was very precise. Um, also, details about his equipment at this Giro d'Italia. He switched this year from 172.5 centimeter pedal cranks to 175 centimeter or millimeter sorry pedal cranks that that's quite a bit that could be quite a big difference he's not crazy legs crane is he i mean <laughs> uh, well i have to say that daniel reads gazetta with more attention than me because would you know that okay i write about numbers about tactic about strategy but you know dear listeners i'm not really concentrated on what I'm doing here. So, I mean, I write with a kind of inspiration, but you don't have to take all the things that I write 100% sure, uh, Leo. Or even seriously. Not, even seriously. No, not at all. Not at all. And uh, unfortunately, now I have to go, but we don't talk for anything about Filippo Pozzato. I was about to say, Ciro, this was Pozzato Day. This was, we, Lionel and I drove past his hometown, San Rigo, on the way to the finish today. He was in the break. He told us earlier this week that this was the day when it was, the magic was going to happen. Alas, his former team, Lamprey, chased him down. Well, but San Rigo, well, we have to be careful with words, but San Rigo could be a kind of house of Vatican of cycling for us because it's really, really important the hometown of Filippo Pozzato. But as a matter of fact, I had the impression that today he has spent more time at TV in the, uh, the transmission of Rai after the stage than in the stage. So, Filippo, what are you doing? But uh, I don't know, but, but my dream to become his manager for his post-career about cycling, I have still this dream. Wow, well, we'll look out for that. But Chiro is, uh, uh, and with that, he's off, running. <laughs> Straight to the buffet. Eurosport, the home of cycling. Thank you to Eurosport for sponsoring us here at the Giro d'Italia and all season, in fact. And now it's time for Richard Moore's nomination for the Peddler de Charme. He's been monitoring social media, to, social media and using his own eyes to come up with a short list of one and award the prize. We'll have to go and find the winner and present him with a Peddler de Charme t-shirt. So who is it today? Small stream there for sure. We can see the rider there. He's looking for his glasses actually in the water. Uh, well, it's been a busy day on the uh, Peddler de Charme beat here in South London. You heard a bit snippet there of the Eurosport commentary. Eurosport, of course sponsor this segment of the podcast peddler the daily peddler de charm award and it was sean kelly spotting lee howard fishing around in a bit of water for his sunglasses and there were a few of you nominated him for today's peddler de charm i'm also sort of bowing to daniel freeb's request he's very fussy daniel and he requested a more left field more quirky pick eurosport also this our sponsors also nominated lee howard but you know, that's not swayed me at all. Uh, there were a few of you nominated Lee Howard. I think that it, it, having been involved in a, in a crash and looking for your sunglasses, that is the very essence of Peddler de Charme. It reminds me of the 1985 Tour de France where Bernardino crashed on the finish into St. Etienne and, you know, bashed himself up badly, broke his nose, two black eyes, but was more concerned by the fact that his Ray-Bans were smashed in the crash. That is... That is Peddler de Charme in a nutshell. So Lee Howard, I am cycling. Today's Peddler de Charme. Daniel Lionel, it's your job tomorrow to make sure he gets a t-shirt. Over to you. Well, an unusual winner there, Daniel. I've not heard of a rider falling into water in a crash before. Uh, you spoke to Lee Howard after the stage. What actually happened? 
Well, Lee Howard unfortunately got wet, didn't he, out on the road to Aslo. It didn't rain today. There were some pretty angry-looking clouds at one point gathering over the, not quite the Dolomites line, but Monte Grappa, which overlooks Azolo. But it, that wasn't the reason why Lee Howard came into the finish dripping wet. He'd actually taken a bit of a dip, unfortunately, in a ditch, in a very full ditch, in a very wet ditch, uh, beside the, the road at a, a very crucial point of the race. So there were various general classification riders that got blocked behind that crash and got held up. Domenico Pozzavivo lost time. He lost about a minute 30 and, and he slipped further back in general classification. But Lee Howard, as you said, I spoke to him at the finish by the EAM Cycling team bus, by which time he had dried out slightly, but um, he wasn't too pleased with the, how the day had gone. Pretty unconventional crash, and I imagine pretty uncomfortable for you. You ended up in a ditch, is that right? Yeah, I ended up in the in the little river, chasing my my sunglasses as they floated away. But no, I'm I'm okay. It was a big big stack. Hopefully, no one's too injured. Any ideas what caused it? Honestly, I'm not sure. I'd like to have, I'd like to see who caused it, or if it was any one person. But um, I mean, I can't complain too much. Like I said, I'm not hurt or not injured too badly. It's just one of those things, mm. uh, especially on a road like that. When you have a crash, everyone behind there's no nowhere to go except over the top, and yeah. And you find yourself floundering around in water, you know, up to your neck in water, sort of 25k from the end of a Giro d'Italia stage. What do you think? My new shoes are very wet. <laughs> I mean, I, honestly, it's better than better than rolling around on the pavement. So, like I said, I can't complain too much. I was in the grass and the water, so. I'm quite lucky. And most Aussies are good swimmers anyway, of course. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been swimming lately. I'm still coming out of winter, but yeah, no, I was, I was like I said, I'm lucky. Um, I ended up in the water, but all's well that ends well. Well, you've been all the highlights reels from now on from this year, but how's the uh, Giro going generally for the team, Lee? So-so. I mean, we had a good result in the time trial. Um, I actually didn't find out the finish today, but I was in that initial breakaway, which... Uh, it was a good break. We had two of us in there, and for some reason that got, that came back. But and then we we really focused on being in the breakaway today, and, and we done that because we thought there was a good chance of it going to the line. But overall, I mean, we definitely would have liked to have won a stage, especially in those first sprint stages with our, our head sprinter Matteo. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, we just couldn't we couldn't get it together as well as we should have. Um, so now we're just taking it day by day. Um, tomorrow's another chance for me in the sprints, and uh, we'll see how we go. Okay, well, a few more opportunities between now and Turin. Don't forget your rubber ring and your armbands tomorrow. <laughs> you are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia, supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science in Sport for sponsoring us here at the Giro d'Italia. As a result of that, they are offering our listeners a 20% discount on their products. So if you fancy getting your hands on uh, some Science in Sport products at a discounted price, visit www.scienceinsport.com and type in the code SIS20. That's SIS20 when you check out. Now, Daniel, interesting, just before we heard the Science in Sport jingle there, that you were mentioning the uh, quality of the roads here in Italy. It's something I certainly noticed in the south of Italy. Um, as we've got a little bit further north, the road quality has improved a little bit, but um, nowhere near as smooth as the roads in the town of Maranello, where we stayed last night, which is, of course, the home of Ferrari. Um, we headed from there this morning to the Maserati factory, didn't we? We had a little guided tour. Well, we are trying to take in a bit of local colour, and in that area of Italy, so the the centre really, well, the centre north of Italy is on the line of where the Apennines head south. There are a number of towns there that have made their name and become very famous because of the sports car companies that are based there. Ferrari are based in Mar uh, Maranello, uh, Lamborghini are also in the region, and of course Maserati, who are very kindly lent us a car for the Giro d'Italia and they're based in Modena where the stage started today and um, also the home of balsamic vinegar Lionel um, you were very excited to well at the prospect of perhaps going to somewhere so, where we might get some good local vinegar but it's a didn't. lovely drink <laughs> it's a lovely <laughs> drink and uh, parmigiano reggiano parmesan cheese who of course we should mention our sponsors or partners of Bardiani CSF stage mm. winners yesterday um, however as we were saying we 
dropped in on Maserati this morning in Modena. We went to the the um, main plant, the headquarters of Maserati. We were very privileged to have the company and have the wisdom of Giorgio Manicardi, who is a a bit of an institution, we were told, at Maserati. He's been there for many decades. And he gave us a guided tour of the factory. And even if you're not interested in sports cars, which we were not particularly before this Giro d'Italia, Giorgio is a fascinating man, fascinating Well, he's a, passion, he's a passionate speaker, isn't he? Anyone who talks with such passion about the thing that they're knowledgeable about, I think is, uh, is always a compelling listen. I found the factory tour fascinating, the way the cars are all put together pretty much by hand. And on the clock, aren't they? Uh, the cars move around the production line they move from one point to the next point to the next point and they finish 10 cars a day and here he is Giorgio Manicardi explaining a little bit about why the centre of Italy has become such a mecca for sports car enthusiasts and sports car manufacturers and also where the very famous Maserati logo the Neptune's Trident comes from this is the Motor Valley <laughs> you know okay. because first of all Maserati was born no, Maserati really was born in Bologna, but uh, it is the first uh, uh, car company sitting in Modena in 1939. The company moved from Bologna to Modena, and uh, around Maserati were born uh, uh, suppliers because uh, we know that in the past uh, most of the ca- car company were producing uh, small numbers. Maserati was a company producing three, four hundred cars a year. Ferrari, 200, 250. Lamborghini, 70. The Tommaso, 50. Um, Maserati was founded by Maserati brothers. There were uh, seven Maserati brothers. One died very young, six Maserati brothers. One of them was uh, not involved in cars, uh, but he was an artist. Mario Maserati was the man uh, designing uh, the Trident. Maserati was born in Bologna. Maserati brothers um, charged Mario, who was an artist, a painter, to find the logo. And uh, walking in Bologna, he has reached the main square, Piazza Maggiore, where there is a fountain at the center, there is the statue of Neptune with the trident. And that became the logo. And we have the original design made by Mario Maserati. And there is a link between uh, cars uh, and uh, trident, because the legend tells uh, that uh, Neptune, throwing the trident into the sea, had uh, horses born. And a lot of horses under the hood. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you very much to Maserati UK for sorting us out. Obviously, every Grand Tour involves an awful lot of driving, uh, not just the distance from the start of the stage to the finish, but off to our hotel each night. Um, we probably clock up, what, 4,000 kilometres? Uh, must be more. Uh, we, we'll have a count, but uh, we haven't done the Netherlands in the Maserati, only the Italian legs, but it's still clocking up quite a, quite a few kilometres on, uh, on the dashboard, isn't it? It, it is, Lionel. It, it's just a very interesting journey, independently of the bike race. Um, you know, you, you do the Giro d'Italia year after year, and you kind of notice, as the old, the great, um, far more distinguished journalists than us used to notice in days gone by, you know, there were some very uh, um, decorated and, and celebrated writers that used to cover the Giro d'Italia for papers like La Repubblica, Corriere della Sera, um, guys who have also written very, very famous books, novelists, and they would talk about the Italy that they saw in front of their eyes as well as the, the bike the bike race and how Italy was evolving, etc. And it's just been very interesting over the last couple of weeks to you know s- take a bit of a snapshot of Italy and how it's recovering from the economic crisis that we've mentioned, and also you know things like the ethnic diversity, which is certainly much greater than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago when I started covering the Giro d'Italia, and yet we still see some of the, the hallmarks and the real the trademarks of. Italy that we saw back then you know the passion for the bike race the passion for the Giro is one of them and that you know there have been good crowds here in Azolo we're in a, a a real hotbed of cycling here this really is the equivalent in the cycling industry of what the Maranello area is for the car industry because we're just down the road or we're just a few hundred meters away here from the Selle Italia and the Selle Royale headquarters well, one man who's not going to be seeing any more of Italy as uh, the Giro d'Italia goes on is Tom de Moulin, who had six days in a pink jersey in the first week. 
Uh, he pulled out today at around about the halfway mark and he had a little gathering at his bus while the stage was still going on and explained exactly why it is that he is out of the race. Of course, as a cyclist, you want to finish a Grand Tour. That's uh, almost goal number one for every cyclist who starts a, a Grand Tour. Yeah, it was not possible. I tried it yesterday. I had already problems before the rest day. I, I hope to recover. Didn't work. I tried to fight on yesterday and today before the start I knew it was going to be very difficult but I still wanted to try. I thought maybe maybe two flat days will make it uh, a little bit better and um, but yeah it was it didn't make sense anymore to continue. I would uh, I would not have a chance now to recover from the and and I would only uh, make it worse probably to continue. Right now I'm just disappointed. I think in a few days I I can look back on this Giro as as being very successful and uh, but now it's it's a bit difficult. When did you first start to feel the discomfort in your saddle area? Which stage was it? The day after stage six, so stage seven, uh, I had I had some problems, and uh, then it worsened actually every day. It's a problem that isn't going to get any easier as the race goes on, isn't it? Apparently not. <laughs> no, I hoped it to recover a bit uh, during the rest day, but um, it didn't really, and. Uh, Maybe a little bit, but then uh, yesterday's uh, 220k really hard stage really didn't make it better. So, yeah. was it a, a, a sounds a daft question, but it, was it a really uncomfortable day in the saddle yesterday? It was, yeah, yeah. You didn't have any thoughts of uh, not getting to the finish. I thought, okay, now I started and I I went on and on and on and then and then I was quite close to the finish. So I, I thought, okay, I. I just finished today and then we'll take conclusions afterwards. Yeah, actually this morning I, I also again tried it, but uh, it, wasn't, it was enough now. So Tom de Moulin there suffering with really the, the injury that cyclists can't brush off, the saddle sore. Um, that's one that's not going to get better. You spend four hours, five hours a day in the saddle. There's no time for it to recover. Very little that can be done really to treat it um, while the race is going on. He'd had hope that the rest day would give him a little bit of respite, but no luck for Tom de Moulin. So we'll see how the rest of his season pans out. And that leaves St- Stephen Kreuzweich, the Lotto NL Jumbo climber, as the Dutch hope for this Giro d'Italia, lying fourth overall. And I caught up with him at the finish. A day like today, as a G contender um, is it one that you're just glad to tick off because it's flat for so long and then really punchy at the end and a lot of aggression yeah it's a it's a, it's a hard day and especially the final you have to be concentrated and fight for your position because that's the most important of the day oh, okay the, the final was pretty pretty tough but uh, I felt good so for me it was uh, it was nice to to test myself a little bit and uh, to see what the other guys uh, would do it's a it's a day you have to survive and looking ahead to Saturday in particular, the, the leading group of contenders is going to slim down uh, quite considerably on Saturday, we would expect. What's your strategy going to be going into that? I don't know yet. I have to see first Friday. We have a, we have a hard race and yeah, we have to see what that's going to, going to bring and uh, tomorrow as well. And uh, we'll, we'll make a plan for it. Okay, very lastly, Tom de Moulin has uh, gone home today and that makes you, uh, the, the weight of du- Dutch hope is on your shoulders. Uh, yeah, that's that's okay. Tom did it perfectly the first ten days, and uh, I hope I can uh, take his place over. So we'll see what Stephen Kreuzweich is made of when the big mountains come. He's been riding a fairly conservative race, although he did show himself a little bit by trying to chase down the moves that were going on. Well, both the climbs really. He was he was quite prominent at the front, but the big mountains are where he will hope to make gains very handily placed. He is, and it will be very interesting to see how he approaches the big mountains because last year he lost an awful lot of time in the first week. He lost about 11 minutes, I think, in the first week and just really moved through the gears as the race went on and and benefited really from the freedom that he had by virtue of being so far down on general classification. He's riding a completely different race this time. He's really trying to follow the best riders. And some guys can adapt to that and some guys can really step up and some can't. Um, Kruiserweg has been very discreet so far. He's not really done an awful lot. His team hadn't haven't had to work at all. And he looks to have been very economically, but 
you know, the, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating in the last week. Well, speaking of eating, they packed up the buffet here, so uh, it, my thoughts That's are now to... my thoughts are now turning to dinner and our and our hotel. So we should probably wrap it up there, Daniel. Tomorrow, a very flat stage. Uh, we've got to go to a computer shop because I've had what what's called a casino today. Is that right? I've, I've left my laptop charger in my in the hotel. Or a morning. Lionel Blair. I've had a Lionel Blair. A Lionel Blair. Bernie, but a Lionel Blair. Yeah, morale really has dipped this afternoon because well, I'm on about 40% battery on my laptop. A journalist without a laptop is really, I mean, it's like a, like a professional cyclist without a bicycle. W- what food stuff could take you back up to 100%? Could oh. take you up... Back up to Giro Italia form line. Well, I think a, a, a combination of the antipasti, prima piatti, seconda piatti, and it, bring, bring it on. I will make it my business to make all of that happen for you this evening. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for listening. We'll be back again tomorrow. In the meantime, Daniel, thank you. Thank you, Lionel.